Okay, well, um, I just have a brief text that has one idea in it, and uh, we're going to be spending all of our time this morning, after we get past the review, uh, trying to unpack what that means, and, and we're really only going to be able to touch on it. I mean, who can describe everything that Jesus did uh, out of his love for the Father? But hopefully, we'll get the point and get some good examples and encouragements here. But I'd like to read um, John chapter 14, verses 28 through 31. And really the point is in verse 31. Jesus says, you, you heard, and by the way, this is the Upper Room Discourse, and we're going to see a little bit more about that this evening because Jesus in this particular discourse says a great deal about his love for his disciples. But he says this, you have heard that I said to you, I go away. And I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of the world is coming and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. So the idea here is, Jesus says, uh, I love the Father, and so that it might be obvious, you know, not just to them, but to the world that he does. He says, I do exactly as he has commanded me. Well, I've already told you, we've been looking, and hopefully you remember some of this from the previous weeks, we've been looking at how the Christian faith is mainly, it's primarily, and almost exclusively about love. And remember, not just any kind of love, but love for holiness. And by the way, I'm, I'm not drawing all this exclusively from the religious affections. I am taking a little bit of a different tact here because Edwards in that book simply argues all these points by looking at the examples and, and looking at just the how great the affections were, the love was for these particular individuals that we've been looking at, but we want to see sp these specific act of, acts of love and how, you know, God's grace in our hearts will produce the same kind of thing. Now, last week, Dr. Reeves was reminding us of that same thing, and Dr. Reeves, you know, is steeped in his reading of the Puritans, and Jonathan Edwards was very much a Puritan, and they were going to the very you know, root of the issues, the very heart of the issues, and the heart of the issue is love. So last week, Dr. Reeves reminded us that you know, holiness, that which calls us to be holy, the law calls us to be holy, and so forth, that that really is love. You, know, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy, is another way of saying you shall be holy morally good. You shall love what is right because I, the Lord your God, love what is morally right. And at the same time, I hate what is evil, the Lord says. This love for holiness is what makes us want God. It makes us inclined towards God. It makes us choose God and everything that God loves and to disincline toward the things that he hates. Now, we know that this love is central to the Christian faith, and, and that's made even clearer by what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, that God has predestined us, the Father has predestined us, that is, he has predetermined that we will be conformed to the image of his Son. And that doesn't mean, of course, we'll bear his physical likeness, but it means that we will share in his character, his his love for what is good and what is right. Jesus is the perfect example of love. And God has planned to make us just like him. Now that is why Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit in the new birth to create this love in our hearts that produces not only love in general, but all the different fruits of love. Remember, Jonathan Edwards you know, sees love as the fountain the source from which all these other fruits of the Spirit actually come, those of, of joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we have the Spirit of God, then we have this love. 
And if we have this love, Paul tells us we have all these fruits. But of course, the stronger that this love grows, the more we will see these fruits in our lives. And by the way, isn't, aren't those fruits just a wonderful description of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, to strengthen this point further, we went on to see how God's grace worked itself out in the lives of a couple of ordinary human beings, like David and Paul. We may not think of them as ordinary, but they're really no different than we are, except that they love the Lord perhaps more than we do. And that's really the only difference uh, when it comes to their character, not their giftedness, but, but their character. Now, remember, David tells us about his heart towards the Lord in the Psalms, how he, he says the Lord is his portion, his inheritance. That is what he prized most in this life. He put God first in his life. That his desire for God was like a, like a thirst that could only be quenched by drawing near to him. When he says the Lord is my cup, he means that he is the one essentially who quenches that desire of his heart to draw near to him. Uh, th that quench or that thirst, of course, made him seek God's face every day. Remember, the face of God is the face of his blessing. He wanted to see that favorable um, countenance of, of God. Uh, he was deeply troubled when God seemed distant and his, and his face was hidden. So he, he would seek to deal with those issues that separated him from God. We saw, of course, in Psalm 23 that he trusted the Lord to meet his needs and to provide everything uh, that he needed in life, to be with him in difficulty, to discipline him when he strayed, and to take him home when his time on earth was over. God was at the very center of David's life, and it's because David loved the Lord, and he loved him because of this grace, the same grace that Jesus gives to us. And we saw the same thing in the Apostle Paul, how he loved Christ. And one of the things that I want to argue is to love Christ is the same thing as to love God, because he is the image of God. We'll, we'll look a little bit more at that in a moment. And this love gave Paul the strength to let go of the world because he found in Jesus Christ all that he needed and even more than he needed. It gave him the strength to pursue, or as in modern terms we say, to press into knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, not just learning about him from a book, you know, this is true of him, this is true of him, this is true of him, but rather to experience Christ and, and his life in his own life. He wanted to experience his power in his ministry, but he also wanted to know what it was to suffer to know Christ in his sufferings. And these things moved him to serve Jesus with the same sacrificial love and humility that Jesus had shown in his service to him. And I think it, all of us can be topped off by um, remembering that Paul's greatest desire in life was to serve Jesus while he was here. But if he had the choice, he would much rather leave because you know, nothing on earth compared to Christ. He would rather depart and be with Christ, which is very much better than anything that he might experience on earth, because the best that he might experience on earth was but a down payment of what he receives in full in heaven. Now, today I want us to look at the greatest example, the one that these two men actually followed, and David followed him as well, that shows us that the Christian faith, the grace of God, what it creates it's, is this love. That the Christian faith, again, um, it, is all about love. And that example, of course, is that of our Lord Jesus Christ who was anointed with the Spirit above measure. Now, I want us to begin by what he says about his, his own heart towards his Father in that verse in our text in John 14, verse 31. He says, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Jesus loves the Father. Now, that, that seems like an obvious point, doesn't it? But you know, the funny thing is, as I was looking in Scripture to find you know, more of these kinds of statements, I found that this is the only time that Jesus actually says that. <clears throat> 
Now, the Father, in many places uh, in Scripture, He declares His love for the Son. <clears throat> the Son says that the Father loves Him. You know, um, John the Baptist, when, um, when he was speaking about Christ after his baptism, says the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Jesus Himself says the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He is doing. Uh, Matthew tells us that the Father said at Jesus' baptism, this is my beloved Son for everyone to hear. But Jesus says it only once. Now, of course, He only has to say it once for it to be true. But He gives us, in, in the example of His life, the compelling evidence that shows us that that statement is actually true. Because He doesn't just say that he loves the Father. He actually shows that he loves the Father. His entire life was a continual act of love towards him. You know, we read in Scripture, besides the point, of course, we, you know, I noted in our prayer as we began that Jesus certainly showed his love to the Father by being careful to um, worship him faithfully on, on the Sabbath. Uh, in, in those days, it would have been on Saturday, but in the New Covenant, we know that Sunday. He wanted to show his father his love, and so he met with God's people to worship him. But we also see in Scripture that there were other things Jesus did, of course, quite a bit more. Sometimes he would spend whole nights with his father in prayer, whole nights. You're thinking, you know, what did Jesus have to pray about that would take an entire night? But let's not forget that prayer is not just asking God for things, but it's fellowshipping with Him. It's worshiping Him. It's communing with Him. It, you know, time in prayer is actually time spent with God. And when you love someone, you want to spend time uh, with them. You want to be near them. And, and that's what Jesus shows us in His life is that He spent time with His Father. Uh, we see in Scripture that Jesus was jealous for God's glory. We might call it, um, you know, he was, he was zealous, but, but it's a jealousy that God, his Father, be honored. And we see that perhaps, uh, well, in many places, but here's one example where uh, Jesus deals with an issue that's ongoing inside the temple in John 2, verses 13 through 17. The Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, that last statement, that's what Jesus experienced when he saw going on within his father's house of worship, this house of prayer, this place where God's people were to gather to have fellowship and nearness with him. Instead, they were taking advantage of the people and simply, you know, profiting themselves. That zeal moved him to deal with the issue and to defend his father's honor by removing the things that were offensive to him from his house. Now, we might think that the, you know, the application of that for us is that we should, when we see something going amiss in a church, is to stand up and deal with it right there, but we need to remember that our Lord Jesus Christ had authority to do this because that was His house, right? He is the Son over the house. Not just anyone could do what He did in this case, but that He was jealous for God's glory is something we can imitate. We know that He obeyed His Father, He says in our passage, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Now, we know that Jesus didn't just obey him in some things, right? Just some of the commandments, but all of them. And not just at some times, but he did this all the time. He says, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. And this, as we've already seen, was not difficult. It wasn't a burden for him. It was his pleasure to do this. 
Speaking by the Spirit through David in Psalm 40, verse 8, he says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. You know, when you love someone, you want to please them. Jesus loved his Father, and so he delighted in obeying him in everything that he called him to do. It was something that he tells his disciples uh, that fed or satisfied him, okay? You have this idea, it, when you're hungry, you want to satisfy that hunger with food. And when you're thirsty, you want to satisfy that thirst with water. But when you love the Lord and you want to show him that love, that thirst is only satisfied by actually doing what the Lord has called you to do. Jesus said to his disciples in John 4, 34, my food that which satisfies me is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So he not only obeyed, but he obeyed uh, delightfully. It was his joy to do this. And his joy in obeying his father is what we know enabled him to make his greatest sacrifices. The first, when he took our nature and came into this world, we need to remember that he is eternally the son of God and being, you know, existing in the form of God, as Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, he didn't regard equality with God something to be held on to, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Now, we know that Jesus did not empty himself of his divinity and become merely a man, but his emptying was in taking to himself a nature that was infinitely below the creator becomes one of his creatures without ceasing to be the creator. We cannot imagine how humbling it must have been for the one who is the eternal God to become a man and to dwell among sinful men and to have to endure everything that he endured. But the Son of God not only did this, he did it joyfully because he was loving his father. And of course, the second thing we think about that we don't often think about Jesus delighting to do, but he did, was when he willingly offered himself up to satisfy his father's justice on our behalf. Paul continues in Philippians 2, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But Jesus did this willfully and willingly, right? He says in John 10, 18, no one has taken it from me, my life. Um, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. You know, Matthew Henry in his commentary, uh, paraphrasing the, the verse we're looking at this morning where he says that the world may know that, the Father, that I love the Father, I do exactly as he commanded me. He paraphrases it in this way that the world may know that I love the Father, you shall see how cheerfully I can meet the appointed cross. Okay, now that is really what Jesus has in mind in that statement because that is his ultimate uh, obedience to the Father is in <clears throat> giving himself to go through that suffering and that death on the cross in order to fulfill his Father's will to complete his mission. Now again, Jesus didn't just say that he loved the Father. He showed that he loved him. Love is more than just a feeling. Love is more than just a statement, a declaration. Love is really an action, isn't it? Not just an action, but it is, it is action, right? Uh, if we love the Lord, we will do what it is he calls us to do because we love him, not, not to mention the fact that what he calls us to do is to love. That's what the commandments, again, are all about. Now, Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit. You know, he's the, the, the Christ, the anointed one. The Spirit of God was given to him above measure so that he might fulfill that image we see in the Old Testament, you know, which sometimes, again, seems rather strange, but when the, um, the high priest was, uh, was anointed for his office, oil would be poured on his head. You know, that may not seem to us like a thing we'd want to have to go through, but it was something that was 
it was pleasurable for them, but the idea, though, is as the oil is poured on him, it drips down his head, his beard, down his, down his garments, to the edges of his robes, and that this is really a picture of the Christ, who is our priest, our great high priest, being anointed with the Holy Spirit, and how the Spirit flows from our head, the Lord Jesus, to the members of his body. And let's not forget the purpose of that, not only to empower us, to serve him, but the way in which the Spirit of God empowers us to serve him. He doesn't give us super strength or knowledge that somehow we couldn't otherwise know. He changes our hearts to give us the ability to overcome our reluctance so that we actually will do that. So he gave us the Spirit that we might have this same love. And again, not only for the Father, but also for him. Remember, the author to the Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews 1, verse 3, that Jesus is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Jesus himself tells us when he comes into the world that he has come to explain the Father, to exegete him in a certain way, kind of like what we do with a passage of Scripture. We try to understand what it means, and then we explain it, right? Well, that's what Jesus came to do regarding the Father, to explain who he is to us, which means we cannot love one without loving the other. And that's why Jesus told the Jews, if you don't love the Son, you really don't love the Father either because the Son is the image of the Father. So now that we've seen what Jesus is like, we need to ask what will that love that Jesus had for his Father look like in us? Well, pretty much the same as it did in Jesus, but, you know, again, maybe not expressed in exactly the same way. So if we love God, if we love Jesus, we will certainly want to gather and worship him with his people on his holy day. If we love the Lord, we will want to draw near to him in prayer, won't we? This is perhaps, actually, those two things are perhaps the most obvious ways that we can measure our love for the Lord. How much time do we spend in prayer? How much time do we spend in worship? Sometimes, you know, I think that for, for many of us, our, our prayers devolve to just what we offer to the Lord before we eat our meals. And maybe we'll thank the Lord for the food and ask Him for His blessing, and maybe we'll lift up a couple of requests, and that may be the extent of it. Well, that, that wasn't what it, the extent of it in Jesus' life. And that's because he knew that prayer wasn't just asking for things, but it was spending time with his Father. Love will make us seek God's face in Christ. We'll also be jealous for God's glory. Remember what Luke tells us about Paul's experience when he was at Athens and he was waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him, how his spirit was provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. You know, Paul looks at that and he says, you know what, <laughs> these people in this city are giving the glory that is meant for the invisible God to these statues that, that aren't even alive. I mean, these, these uh, stone images of, of men. And he was provoked because he was jealous for God's glory and he wanted God to be honored and worshiped and praised. And so, he did something about it. Luke continues, so he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present, going even as far as the Areopagus to, uh, as it were, reason with the philosophers of the day. In other words, he stepped up to defend God's honor by proving that Jesus was the Christ. You see, if we're jealous for God's glory and honor, if we, if we love him, we will seek to do the same thing, to defend his honor and his glory by defending his truth and by telling others what he has done in Christ. By the way, that's one of the reasons why we, we did all the apologetics that we did and why we're seeking to know the gospel in the way that we should know it is so we can defend his honor and the same time, gather more people together to give him glory and honor. Uh, we will also conscientiously obey him as Jesus 
said to his disciples, remember, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and will seek to live according to that standard all the time, to the whole standard, not just when it's easy, but also when it's difficult. Matthew Henry writes this in his commentary. He says, when we talk of troubles at a distance, it is easy to say, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. But when it comes to the pinch, when an unavoidable cross lies in the way of duty, then to say, arise, let us go to meet it, instead of going out of our way to miss it, this lets the world know that we love the Father. I think we have to agree. Matthew Henry is, is right. We will obey him, and we will do it um, not, you know, grudgingly. It won't be a burden to us, but it will be a joy, as our meditation reminds us, John, 1 John uh, 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. As I said before, it, it's not hard to obey when you're told to do something you want to do. Okay, what makes it hard is when you're told to do something you don't want to do. But the Spirit of God changes that dynamic by giving to us the desire to do what the Lord calls us to do. And that is what makes trusting Jesus and obeying Him a pleasure rather than a burden. Now, I think we'd all admit that we still have remaining sin in our lives. And to the degree that that sin is unsubdued, unmortified, we're still going to have some difficulty here. We're still going to have the desire to disobey, and that's going to make it harder to obey. But our desire to obey because of the Spirit of God within us will overcome the desire not to obey. We will put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We will grow in His love, and we will grow in His obedience. Walking with Him will be so satisfying to us that we'll be willing to give up everything for God. You see, when, that's when we know that we're in the place that we need to be. And actually, you know what Jesus said? Unless we had that willingness, we couldn't even begin the Christian life. Okay? We, we need to grow in this love. Our love for the kingdom of heaven is to be like the man who found the, the treasure hidden in the field, right? He sold everything he had, purchased the field so that he could have the treasure. Or the merchant who is seeking the pearl of great price, who when he found it, gave up everything he had that he might possess it. So we are, will be willing to do this as well, even to give up our own lives. Jesus said, whoever does not pick up his cross and follow him is not worthy of him. So in short, our love for the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will move us, as I said before, to conform. You know, we talk about not conforming to the world. We are to be conforming to Jesus Christ. His image is to be stamped on us, okay? Love for the Lord is what causes this conformity. It will move us to become more and more like them, because we'll want to become more like them. And as we do, we will uh, do more what they would do. Now, this evening, we're going to look at how this holy love that the Spirit of God gives us will also influence our relationship with others. You know, so far, we've just been looking at how Jesus uh, fulfills the, the, what's called the first table of the, of the commandments. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that's the right way of putting it, but we know the first four commandments in loving his Father. You know, and, and again, as we think about them, obviously Jesus loved his Father with his whole heart. He, um, he worshiped him the way that was honoring to him. He kept his promises to God, and he kept his, his Sabbaths holy. But we've seen that you know, he did everything he did in perfection and expressed his love to the Father, especially in that first commandment, in the way he lived and the time he spent with him and so forth. This evening, we're going to want to see how he also fulfills the second half, how he loves his neighbor, because Jesus gives new meaning to the idea of you shall love your neighbor as yourself, because Jesus 
did that in a way that it's supposed to be done. And the Spirit of God gives to us that same love and that same desire. Well, let's, uh, let's spend just a couple of moments in prayer thinking about this, asking that the Lord would help us to grow in this love. And as we see the, uh, the Father's love revealed and Jesus' love revealed in the, uh, the table as we sang about earlier, let's let this, this sermon that's preached down here um, remind us again of, of that love so that our love for Him might be strengthened. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.